Welcome to today's edition of Daytime Dialogues. It is my pleasure to welcome a friend and a colleague, Rabbi Ruven Tradberks, who is the director of the Israel Office of the Rabbinical Council of America, two kins today. Uh, Rabbi Tradberks is a Musmach of Yeshiv University. He had served as the Rav of Kilat Shari Torah in Toronto before he and his wife made Aliyah in 2009. And now he not only serves as the director of the Israel office of the RCA, but also has partnered on behalf of the RCA with Shavei Yisrael to create an Ulpan Giyur, a Jewish conversion course in Yerushalayim that's connected with the chief rabbinate. It's been around for about three years and has currently about 20 participants in it. So thank you so much, Rabbi Tradbergs, for making time for today. Pleasure to be here. So let's talk about that Ulpan Giyur for a minute. The issue of conversion through the Rabbanut or conversion in general in Israel has been in the news. And even though Minister Kahana is no longer the Minister of Religion, he's now just a member of Knesset. It was one that we were involved in as an RCA. What are, what's this Ulpan Ligur? Why does the RCA want to be involved in this? Why does it even exist? Okay, so uh, anyone who wants to convert in Israel uh, does through the uh, National Conversion Authority, what's called the Marach Giyur. One of the requirements for a person coming for their final meeting with the Bet Din for approval for, con for conversion is that they have to have passed the official, one of the official courses that prepares a person for conversion. So there's probably a hundred of these courses throughout the country, most in Hebrew, but some in Russian, some in uh, Amharic for the Ethiopians, uh, French, Spanish, all different languages. And so we felt that English speakers um, needed another option. There is a course in Tel Aviv, which is also run by an RCA rabbi, uh, Ariel Constantine, which is an excellent course. Uh, and there a, a was a course in Jerusalem in Machon Meir, which is yeshiva, but it didn't fit for everyone. Um, and so we felt there was a need, we, people had said to us, there was a need for another course to prepare people for conversion. Uh, the reason why they have these courses is because uh, people come with an interest in conversion and they've gone to the rabbis, uh, you know, shiurim at the, the local synagogue, but to have a conversion course that covers everything from beginning to end really, um, they need that because people come from disparate backgrounds and the Rabbanu wants to make sure they've actually covered the basics. So that's why we offer the course. How does it compare? When you were in Toronto still, you were the Menahel of the Beit Din of the Vada Rabbanim in Toronto. How does it compare what you do in this Opan Giyur to what would happen in North America? Is it similar? Is it different? Yeah, that's that's a very good question. So when I was in Toronto, I ran, I ran the Beit Din. There was one Bethan, as there is in Chicago, one Bethan for the Orthodox community. Um, so I was involved in 500 conversions over the, the time I was there. Um, so I was involved on the Bethan side, meaning um, arranging the appointments for people, making sure that they've met the requirements before they come to the appointments, um, updating the Bethan before the candidate would walk in. So I, I, I coordinated uh, that aspect. Here, we're on the other side, we're on the preparation side. In Toronto, you'd have, I'm sure, as you have in Chicago, you have people who are involved in outreach, Chabad, Isha Torah, or Sameach, or whatever, and they would have people who would need to have a conversion. So they would do the preparation part, the teaching of the people, the inviting for Shabbat, and the experience. Here in Israel now, um, that's the part that I'm doing. I didn't do that in Toronto. One of the big differences in conversion in North America that uh, I was involved in is that you have synagogue rabbis, you have shul rabbis. So shul rabbis would have someone who would come to them, sometimes just spiritual seekers, sometimes uh, you know a boy would come home with a non-Jewish girl, or sometimes people would become interested in Judaism because their grandparents were Jewish, but they actually are not because their mother was not. So the, the shul rabbi, would often feel um, excited about someone who wants to come and return to their roots and would be involved with them and invite them for Shabbat. Israel has a different shul structure. Shul is just a different place in people's lives. 
you don't have big, I always feel this when I come to North America, the shuls are beautiful, they're institutions, the rabbis are professional, they dedicate their time. In Israel, shul is a thing you do, but it's not, it's not an institution. And the rabbis are not there to serve communities in the same way. So that's, a, that's one of the big differences, is that in Israel, the Betin requires what they call an adopting family, mishpacha malava, a family that's gonna vouch for the person because they don't have rabbis that are going to do that. That's the big, uh, one of the big differences. Um, and what it means is that sometimes the candidates are not as robust in Israel as they would be in Chicago, for example, because they haven't had kind of a mentor rabbi all the way through their process. I try and fulfill that somewhat, but, but I, I can't, because of COVID, we haven't been able to have people in our home so much. So it's, uh, we've suffered from that. So in your open gear, you're sort of like the sponsoring rabbi in essence. Yes. And the, the, what, the big difference with the Opan Giyur is that um, the government requirement is 400 hours of classroom study, which means if you're, uh, so we run a program of, uh, it's supposed to be from five o'clock until nine o'clock at night, two nights a week eight hours a week for an entire year. That, there is nothing like that in North America going on. There's conversion courses where people who have tutors, but no one's doing eight hours a week for an entire year. That's a real an intensive program. So when you say there's a law that it has to be 400 hours, is that because the Rabbanuta Rashid said, this is what we want, and then it got the seal of the government? Or is that the, like, how does that work? It's not a law. It's not a law. It's not not a law. law. It's, there's a conversion authority that's responsible for conversions, um, and it's actually not even legally a, a body. It's a, it's a government order, but it's not a law of the Knesset that gives them their power. They decided what they felt were the proper standards and requirements for a person to convert. So they require this. So I have to give a person when they're going for their last meeting, a certificate signed that says this person has, has completed the course for conversion that we offer. When we started the course, we met with the head of the conversion authority and they were thrilled that we were doing this and uh, supported it and came to the opening of it um, because they felt it was a good course to offer. Um, so we're an authorized program that does this. But the statistics which I've heard about the number of converts in Israel who maintain their um, religious observance is very low. From what you're describing, it seems like an intense experience. It seems like it has the mishpacha melavau goes along. It seems like it has all the right ingredients. Um, has your experience been the same that, you know, a few years out? So, so, I, so a number of years ago, I don't know what the article was. Rabbi Riskin was being interviewed about uh, conversion or whatever. This was probably six or eight or 10 years ago. So uh, after the interview, one of the Dayanim, who happens to be one of my neighbors and a good friend who spent Shabbat together. So he said to me, is it true, Rabbi Riskin says that 90% of the converts that convert in North America stay observant for the long term. He says, we're nowhere near that. We have a 30% maybe. Um, so I think part of that is that even though I, every time I've been to the Bet Din, they're quite um, insistent that the candidates are keeping Shabbat, keeping kosher, doing a tefillah, praying on a, a, a daily basis, which is what's required of an observant person. But, but uh, a large number of the conversions are people who are converting while they're in the army. You know, an 18 year old uh, young woman in the army who commits to being Shabbat, you know, next year she's going back to her family and then she's going to university and then she's out in the big, big, in the big world. 
because there's not the rabbi figure that's going to stick with her afterwards, um, those, I, I don't doubt the people's sincerity at the moment of the conversion, but life's life. And, you know, 18 year olds, you know, who knows? They don't know where they're going to end up next year. And so a life commitment for an 18 year old, it's a little specious to begin with, you know. So, uh, so the, the difference you think is because of the age of a lot of the converts. In the United States, it's very rare to have someone so young. Yes, I think that's a big part of it. Um, and the other part is that even though our program, I feel quite confident that the people that end or end to finish our program are going to maintain their observance in the long run. You never know what happens at life, you know. Uh, People can go through crisis and reject their observance. That happens to everyone, you know, not just the converts. But, but I'm confident that our our candidates are going to stick with it in the long in the long term. Um, but the ones that are, are converting through the army and uh, can, converting younger, I think, don't have their their life situation is different, and they don't have that rabbi community that they've been with that they'll be they, they will be with in the future, it's different. It's a different situation. It's interesting because in modern times, the last 300 years, 400 years, the idea of a synagogue not being an institution is very rare. The fact that what Israel has in terms of Batei Knesset is the complete opposite of what diaspora jury has and had all that period of time where there was a a rav in a city, there was a rav of a shul, there all of these kinds of things. Israel doesn't. Is it something that's changing? Do we see a landscape shifting at all? Um, you mean so that the so, so more of the normal type of shul structure exists in Israel? Right. It, it's somewhat, somewhat. Um, I, I think there's there are historical things for that too, because when the state started, and they would appoint the rav shuna. Yeah, the state would pay the salary and he would be responsible for his community. Um, it was more like the classic POSEC. So he didn't get involved in, you know, youth programming and, uh, you know, visiting the sick and uh, developing relationships. It was very different. So there is a little bit of a move to that. Um, part of it's money, you know, um, Israelis, I don't know if you have this experience, <laughs> but Israelis that, I knew in Toronto, didn't like to pay shul dues. The North Americans knew, you pay dues, you pay $1,000 a year, $1,500, whatever it was. Israelis didn't want to pay it. They'd negotiate, oh, we'll pay $250. I don't want to malign Israelis because I'm one. But no, but it wasn't I don't, I don't like to pay shul dues either now, but, but you know, that, that's part of it, is that they, don't, they felt that's the government's role. We don't have to pay that. The government provides religion in the state. So, so as a result of that, it's very hard. I just, I won't, I won't use names, but I just had a discussion. I was called up, um, there was a shul that was looking for a new rabbi. So I asked them, well, how much are you paying? Um, so they said, we're paying the equivalent of $30,000 a year for a full-time job. So I said, well, you should advertise. We're looking for independently wealthy people <laughs> to apply to be a rabbi. You know, that, but that's the mentality. Um, so, so because of that, you, the, the rabbis by nature are only going to be giving a shear, um, you know, uh, helping a minimal amount. Uh, there are a lot of very wonderful rabbinic in Israel, lots. And people who serve their communities really lishma because they're not getting paid much. You know, they'll be paid a few thousand dollars, a, you know, a month if they're lucky. Um, so that so that it's, so that structure is not it. It's not a groundswell, even though people are trying to change it. It has not yet happened because the mentality of having to pay for rabbis is just not gaining traction. Well, it's also, it, this really is a good segue talking about also your role as director of the Israel office of the RCA, because you're the first address that a rabbi in America who's thinking of making Aliyah and wants to be a rabbi or wants to hear what happens next, you're the, you're the first place they may go to. Um, my assumption is that most rabbis who make Aliyah are either making Aliyah to retire 
or to start another career in some either related or completely different function. Is that true? Yeah, that's true. Um, I, I feel bad when I have to tell young fellows who have had successful careers that you will not be a shul rabbi in Israel. That's not gonna happen at all. And you have to just disavow yourself of that. And, and it's hard because people say, well, I have skills and I have a proven record and I've done a good job. So I'll probably be able to find something in Israel. You know, I, I have to tell them that, you know, you're not gonna find that. Not, you may not, you will not find that in Israel. Now, uh, at the same time, there are people who, who make Aliyah and find employment in another area can give shiurim and volunteer as a rub in a community. Uh, and sometimes that happens and it, sometimes it happens uh, successfully, but it's not gonna be an income producing. In other words, they're, a, they're able to fulfill their Yetzir Hara to be a Rav, but, but yeah. it's not it's a it's all lishma. Well, all rabbi my lishma. You know that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, you. But your primary role and our primary connection is as the Israel, the Israel office of the RCA. So it's the Rabbinical Council of America, which to begin with is an has members all around the world. The name doesn't match, and then it has an Israel office. Why do we need an, an American rep of of a diaspora organization, which doesn't even have the kinds of things? In Israel, you know, if we had rabbis in Israel like rabbis in America, you want them. What What's the main things that you're involved in today? Well, well, first of all, I just correct one thing. There are many rabbis in in Israel who were congregational rabbis. They're just not doing it. Doing it. I agree. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> so, and there, but there are some. There are some. There are some. I shouldn't say there. No one's going to be able to be. A, there are some communities that have Anglo influence that do have full-time rabbis in Modi'in, in Ranana, somewhat, you know, a couple of them in uh, Yerushalayim and some of these. So there are some, but very, very small number. Um, the, I think the, the impetus for having a, a representative in Israel uh, in this iteration, uh, there, was, there was a director of the Israel region of the RCA for many, many years, Fred Hollander, who ran a lot of programs actually on, on behalf of the RCA in Israel. Um, but things have changed. When he, when he was running programs, they had, for example, an Ulfan Ligior, a conversion course for um, Anglos. They ran educational programs for Ethiopians. They ran educational programs on Judaism for uh, army officers. But those things became taken over by the government over time. They were good programs. And that, those kind of needs uh, faded. Uh, the, the major this was that there's so much um, travel between Israel and the United States that people come to Israel to make Aliyah. Um, they come to get married in Israel. More and more people uh, want to get married in Israel and they have to register for their marriage and they have to present documentation. Sometimes the documentation is rejected. And there was a sense that the, the chief rabbinate in Israel needs someone to talk to, uh, and we need someone who's going to talk to the chief rabbinate when there's miscommunication, and so that issues can be dealt with. I mean, issues. Someone would come to get married in Israel and did a conversion in Chicago, and they would present their document and say, We converted in Chicago. The, the person they're presenting it to, if it's the, the Rabbi Newton uh, Ashkelon, doesn't know what a Chicago is. They, they don't know what that is. Um, so they would need, they would say, well, we don't know what to do with this. We don't know, is that an Orthodox thing, Chicago Rabbinical Council, what is that? So um, by having a representative and the, you know, the, if the documents came to the chief rabbi's office, it would be very easy then to communicate with the office and say, oh, this is what this is, or this is who this is. And, um, and so that was very efficient. So, I, so there are people in the chief rabbi's office that I have a nice relationship with, can easily pick up the phone and they'll you know, uh, deal with whatever issue it is that we have. So I remember um, 
many years ago, I was in Israel on a trip and I uh, was at a luncheon and Rev Ariel, who was the Rav of Ramat Gan was there sitting at the table with me. I was introduced to him and he told me, he, he looked at me and he gave me Musser. He said he had just recently received a letter from me attesting to someone's Jewish status and he had no idea who I was. And it had happened that because somebody who knew me walked into the office right when he was looking at it, that he found out who I was and he accepted the document. So he told me, make sure from now on, you always put at the bottom, past president, rabbinical council of America. <laughs> and I always sign it this way under the title. I always have it on there because of that. And it, it's, a, it's a real problem because Amer American Jews are not only many, but we also have many different communities, which it's hard for an Israeli to understand or hard for an Israeli to get a handle on it. Yeah, and to, and to their defense, they're not just dealing with North America. They're dealing with South America, you know, and uh, the former Soviet Union and Europe. And there are a lot of people, you know, they get hundreds of documents from around the year, uh, around the world every year. And it is hard to keep up with who's who. I mean, it's, it's hard. And after doing it this long, we've been doing it really for a while as this, in this role and successfully, is it the kind of thing where the chief rabbinate will pick up a phone and say, Rabbi Tradberks, or however they pronounce your last name, I know how they do mine, mm -hmm. uh, do you know this person or is it more that unfortunately the bureaucracy will get in the way and then you have to resolve things? Yes, <laughs> and, and, uh, it's, um, I, I, I wish it was, I, I offered at one point, I said to them, you get, you know, 15 documents a week in English, and the guy who was running it doesn't read English. So, um, you know, I'll come in once a week and uh, I'll just look through the documents. Thank you very much. They're not interested. There is a power thing about that. So, so the answer is that there's a very good communication between the Beth of America and the documentation, the person who runs the documentation in the chief rabbi's office. So the answer is that there are lots of times where they pick up the phone and call. So that's a very, a very good thing. Um, not as often, we, you know, you and I would rather have issues dealt with quietly before they hit the press, but sometimes that doesn't happen. But I will say, you probably haven't seen anything in the press in the past four or five years about you know scandals that the revenue doesn't accept someone. So that's a good thing. That is a good thing. No, it's gotten better. It's 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 and it is a challenge. And I think one of the things we have a difficulty um, conveying to the chief rabbinate is that there are Orthodox rabbis who you can rely upon regularly. And then there are a lot of Orthodox rabbis who sometimes um, may not, may have done something al halacha, but it wasn't necessarily on the standard of what the chief rabbinate would have wanted. For well, that was well said, that was well said. Yeah, yeah. and, uh, and it's, a hard, uh, it's a hard concept for them. Yeah, I think I think part of the, um, another issue, uh, thing that's, that's a, f uh, a foment is that um, Israeli, I'm just there in terms of the RCA, not the chief rabbinate, um, because you do such a good job in Mizrahi and Kol Tor Metzion, and so many talented young men and women go from Israel and see a different type of community structure in North America that's vibrant and works and effective, many things which work well in North America are being brought back to Israel, including shuls, including you know, more vibrant shuls and youth programming. And that actually has had a big impact on the Dati Lumir community in particular in Israel, in that Kol Tormet Sion has brought ideas back to Israel from people who have gone on Shlichut. And there is pressure now to develop more robust, um, so you, so you have rabbinic organizations which you or training programs which you never had before, uh, because and that's all been, in, you know, many of the um, wonderful changes in the religious landscape in Israel have been brought back from people who have had wonderful experiences in Huslarts, so that's something we're talking about as well now is how to 
a kind of more international sharing of, um, of ideas and contacts that will enrich both sides, Israelis and North Americans. Now, I've seen them, I've seen some of those courses. In fact, I've spoken at a couple of them remotely and in person because the model of, of, a, of a rabbi in North America is so very different than the model in Israel. Um, yep. And the expectations are so very different. If we didn't have uh, children's groups in shul on Shabbos, there are people who wouldn't come. Sure, uh, sure. If there, if there aren't children's shul groups in the neighborhood synagogue in Israel, well, it's still the closest synagogue. And it may be the only one within easy walking distance. So they'll figure out and the kids will play outside. Like, yeah, right. you, the, one of the nice things that Israelis bring when they come on Shlichut to North America is the model of kids running wild through the halls of the shul. <laughs> yes. Supervised. You know, that's the way it kind of goes. In I see that. There's a lot of and, wonderful things that come both ways. And are there, are there other things? So I would, say, I would say also, I would say also, we shouldn't be so uh, paternalistic to think that our rabbinic models in North America are the best and we can, you know, help out the poor little cousin in Israel so much energy that exists in the Dati Lumi community in, in Israel comes back to North America and energizes our North American communities. So it is, it is both ways, whether it's music or it's energy of, uh, you know, uh, Zionism that comes back and energy in terms of commitment to Lumina Torah. So there is a, a so there, there's no question. Both, both I, ways. It goes both ways. I was just speaking to the, uh, the musical promoter, there's going to be a Rebo, a Yishai Rebo concert in New York uh, that has sold out the Ash, uh, the, um, the right, Arthur Ashe Arthur Stadium. Ashe Stadium, and it is the night of graduation of YU, so it's co-sponsored by YU, and it's all going to come together in one big piece. So Yishai Rebo, that kind of religious fervor coming from Israel, is even having the impact on the most recent. Uh, yeah. The Musmachim of Yeshiva University. So that does. I, I know that it goes back and forth. You you know that Mizrahi has a wonderful new magazine, the Mizrahi, and the and the recent issue was on music, and the Israeli music, the whole Israeli music scene, very religious, um, emotional words and emotional music. There there is nothing like that. I don't think in North America. It's really an Israeli thing. And that's, that's also a, a so we only, have, we only have about another minute or so. Yeah. I, just a real big question, but a short answer, if you would. Since you made Aliyah, and you obviously are living part of the dream of all of us by living in Israel, what was the most positive surprise that you came across in your Perfect. years? That's interesting. I think the... the, the um, the answer to that would be that the, this time of year in Israel, the post-Pesach modern Jewish history days, and the shivers when I said, Yom HaShoah, Yom HaZikaron, and Yom HaTzmut, I never knew how much it would be an expression not of what we should do, but of what we feel we need to do the need to recognize Yom HaShoah and, and Yom HaZikaron and the, like the bursting hearts of Yom HaTzmut. I, I, I never thought I would feel the way I felt in those days. It's, they're so natural and so much an expression of pure joy and the sadness of Yom HaZikaron. Uh, I, was, I was surprised by those days. They've, they've changed me as a person completely completely changed from being a rationalist in the head to being a person of the heart. Really totally different. That is, that's beautiful, amazing. And again, you make us very jealous being here in the Galut and you being able to fulfill that dream. Rabbi Tradbergs, I appreciate your time. I appreciate all that you do for us, by the way, in Israel. And for those who don't know, Rabbi Tradbergs is a very modest person because he has made big things happen in very quiet ways and really made a difference in the lives of many, many people in Chutzlaretz and also now in, in Israel as well. Rabbi, thank you so much for your time. 
and have a Thank wonderful you. rest of your day. Thank you. Right. You too.